Hi there and welcome to 272analytics.com's tutorial on estimation of cumulative hazards in Stata. Now without giving you a bunch of talk about what the cumulative hazard is, uh, which is something that's really best addressed maybe in an epidemiology textbook or something of that kind, I want to create a data set and run some actual procedures. So I can show you in practice what the key code is and what it means, uh, you know, how to generate supporting graphs and that kind of thing, and leave the mathematical foundation and some of the more basic practical description to other sources. So the first thing I'm going to do is going to paste in a bunch of code here, which you can, if you like, freeze your screen if you want to replicate what I'm doing, or you can grab the code from 272analytics.com on the page for the uh, cumulative uh, function there. Um, or you don't have to bother with this at all if you don't want to replicate exactly what I'm doing. All of the code that I've highlighted here is just for the purposes of creating a sample data set with 100 observations that we can run some analysis on. In this data set, there's a couple of things that kind of, you know, leap out here and I just want to highlight them. Uh, we have a variable called fail time. And what that is is just a measure and we can say it's in months uh, off the time to a particular failure. And what I'm visualizing as failure, and there's a very vari variable for that too, fail here, which is a count variable, uh, which is just the number of people who experience a failure at a certain fail time. Um, and finally, there's a treatment here, which is going to take on just uh, two possibilities. So here is what the data set is. Let me first enter the code and then just quickly show, show you the data set. So we have data on 100 folks, uh, and they all failed, by the way. There's no censoring here. I wanted to keep it simple. And from, let's say, 21 months here down to 149, let's say, for the sake of conceptualizing it, that we are tracking 100 people. At the beginning of the study, they were all in remission from cancer, from a certain form of cancer. They were clear of this cancer. And we wanted them to remain clear of this cancer. And so let's say there are two treatments for that. Let's say that there is some form of preventative treatment um, and let's say that there's a control or something of that kind. And those are the two treatments. And what we're kind of really interested in is the, uh, the hazard of having a relapse, of, of having a return of cancer uh, sort of as a function of uh, these two treatments. And the practical motivation for that would be that there would be a lot of interest, both clinical and commercial, in any treatment that could uh, sort of reduce the hazard of uh, a cancer recurrence, right? So a cumulative hazard analysis is one way of, um, you know, exploring these, uh, these data and motivating them. So I'm just going to go jump right into it by creating a table here that's going to show you what I'm, what I'm talking about. And I'm going to create a second table right after it. Uh, STS list is the command in Stata to generate these kinds of survival tables. A cum has, C-U-M-H-A-Z, uh, uh, is just cumulative hazard, and Stata has a lot of options that you can kind of tack on there. Cum has is one of them, uh, and that's because, you know, in this case, it's the subject of our tutorial. That's why it's here. And we can specify by treatment. We could also take that piece of code out, by the way, in which case we'd get this. Um, and let me paste it back in so you can see what it looks like sorted by treatment. And then finally, I'm going to do a graph, and I'm going to put it up there because I think the, gra the graph is really going to help us understand uh, what's going on. And I'll go back through this code in just a second. So let's let this graph generate. Okay. So here we have a cumulative hazard. I think a great way to start this discussion is to read you something from page 14 of uh, the book called An Introduction to Survival Analysis Using Stata by Cleves, Gould, and Marchenko. Here's the relevant passage. Probabilities, however, are not the best way to think about cumulative hazards. An other interpretation of the cumulative hazard is that it records the number of times we would expect mathematically to observe failures over a given period if only the failure event were repeatable. So let's say that the cumulative hazard of something is uh, 10 over a 10-month period. And 
we've already specified that the cumulative hazard here, uh, the hazard, sorry, the nature of the hazard has to do with cancer recurrence. If the cumulative hazard is, uh, let's say, 10 over 10 months, it means that if someone could, you know, magically be freed from cancer every time they got it, um, that that person would reacquire cancer 10 times over that 10 month period. So does that, I, I hope that makes more sense. Uh, you know, obviously this is something that could never happen in the real world. Um, you know, people can't be resurrected to re-experience death as a failure event or, you know, be magically cured of cancer so that we can measure their reacquisition of cancer. But it's a great example to help you get the intuition behind what a cumulative hazard is. And it goes up over time because you know, typically, you know, I mean, I mean, there's different distributions possible of hazards, but uh, with something like cancer, I, I created this data set to reflect that real world pattern and expectation that over time, uh, the risk of someone who has already had cancer to reacquire it, that that hazard would, would increase in a certain pattern. It wouldn't be flat. And what I've done here, which I think is really a useful way of getting at cumulative hazard too, is I've created a graph of the point estimates and the 95% confidence intervals here of the cumulative hazard for the two treatments, right? And the first thing that should be jumping out at you is that they're very similar. They track right on top of each other. And that's really no surprise because I created this data set using the same kinds of random number generation uh, properties for both of these treatments. Uh, in the real world, we might not see something like that. And here we also have a, a sort of a treatment table because there are a lot of values I used an alternating scheme here, but if you follow the mouse here, what we're basically doing is just over time, we're seeing the number at risk. And the number at risk goes down, it goes down, 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 because we are dealing with a data set in which everyone basically experiences the failure event. Okay, and that's that's really made up. That was just for the purposes of this uh, demonstration. Uh, in real life, what you'd get is you'd get censoring. You'd get you know a lot of people at the end of the observation period would not have succumbed to cancer, or would have dropped out of the study or something of that kind. So you you, you would have to think about censoring, uh, you know, ordinarily. But I think for the purposes of a simple demonstration, it's best just to show, um, you know, the data without any censoring. So here, you know, we kind of see the pattern and there's a lot of stuff we can see without even looking at the table. We can kind of see the cumulative hazard is pretty, pretty flat here uh, until kind of late, until I guess close to about 90 months uh, after the beginning of the study. And then after that, we start to see pretty, pretty steady rise here. And then there's a period of like a huge exponential spike that takes place. So it looks like there's a couple of distinct regimes in, you know, the hazard uh, evolution of uh, of cancer reacquisition here for a long time. Risk is really kind of flat, then it increases in a linear fashion, and then it increases in an exponential fashion over time. Uh, we can go back now and look at this table and see our nelson allen cumulative hazard here as it goes on. And so, you know, based on what I told you earlier about the intuition, like if we highlight it here, uh, if someone were sort of examined at 126 months after the beginning of treatment, um, we would expect under treatment one for them to have reacquired cancer 1.1159 times. Obviously, that's a statistical uh, fiction as well as a practical impossibility. But what it's really kind of useful for is, is, is a comparison because I want you to look at the 95% confidence interval here for the cumulative hazard function at 126 months for treatment one. Now let's go down to treatment two. And we don't have an exact comparison, but we can look at month 127 and we can see that the uh, cumulative hazard is very similar here at this point, right? Look at the 95% confidence interval, look at the point estimate, and you'll see that it's almost a perfect uh, overlap for what was going on here at treatment one at about the same point in time. And so basically, you know, the table is also just a way to compare risks at uh, different periods uh, in time, cumulative hazards at different periods in time. So uh, it's a lot to take in, but 
I, I think there's a couple of things that are very helpful and I, I want to close with. The first one is I just want to go back over the code right quick because being able to do this properly in status is of course very important for from a practical point of view. And the second thing is I just want to like re-estimate, uh, re, uh, re-evaluate, I beg your pardon, the intuition behind uh, the cumulative hazard and remind you that it's not about probabilities. You know, it's about exactly like uh, Cleves et al. noted, it's it's about what would happen if you could sort of, re- you know, I don't know, resurrect someone or fix someone and make it possible for them to re-experience the hazard uh, over, you know, a period of time. How many times would that happen? You know, here, for example, at month 149, under treatment two, uh, someone would reacquire cancer, uh, you know, 3.6 times, just about. And so that's that's useful from a comparative point of view, because going back earlier, we can see that the cumulative hazard functions are much lower. And all that does is just reinforces the intuition that there's a real exponential increase in the risk of reacquisition of cancer for treatments one and two, you know, right at the end of the observation period. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is I want to go back and, you know, I want to look at some of the code here. Just remind you that if you're working with these kind of data, you need to ST set them. You need to specify your fail time. And that's that's why it's really, I think, a good thing to just name your variable fail time, uh, which is the time in, you know, months or days or whatever units of time, which is just the time to uh, the failure event. And the number of failures, you should just call that fail as well, um, you know, or something in, intuitive so that you can plug it into the stset command like this. Um, the sts list is a very useful command. Uh, when you put a comma and type in cum has here at the end, you get the cumulative hazard table, which we just saw the interpretation of that and why that's useful. Uh, if we add in by treatment here, in addition to cum has, then we get that broken out, which lets us make those comparisons in the, the tabular format between the cumulative hazard and treatment one and treatment two. And then finally, I want to highlight the code for the graph, which is really important. Uh, you know, because if if you're talking a whole lot of uh, you know fail time uh, entries, it might not be really helpful to just look at the table. Looking at the graphic in about one second, you know, you can figure out that the cumulative hazards are almost identical for the two treatments, which would take you much, much longer time and be inefficient to infer that from the tables. So I just want to say, once again, STS graph was the base command over here. Uh, I put in all this code over here for the X label because I wanted uh, the, the ticks kind of marked from zero months of fail time to 150 months of fail time in five month increments and I wanted them to alternate if you recall the graph uh, let me show you to alternate meaning you know they go up and down and up and down because otherwise they would all like crowd together here so that's what the purpose of this code was right over here that I've highlighted uh, I put in by treatment because obviously I'm interested in separating those out in the graph I put CI for confidence interval I put cum has for cumulative hazard and then finally, the risk table here at the end was what gave me this stuff over here, the number at risk uh, comparisons, which visually kind of let me see, uh, you know, how the number at risk kind of is going down at the same time in a similar pattern for both of these. And here I told the risk table that I wanted it to run from 0 to 150 in increments of 5. Uh, which actually I needn't have done. I just copied that over from, from the X label. Uh, you know, I, I had kind of different values for number at risk and uh, fail time. So that is not actually very efficient on my part. I just want to show you what would happen if we kind of get rid of this. Let me clean that up and get rid of the X label here and generate the graphic again for you. Uh, so this is kind of the more plain vanilla version here. If you don't put in all that fancy code you know, I did right there at the end and just have this simpler command over here. You get this. So the Nelson Allen cumulative hazard graph looks the same. There's no real change there. But for analysis time, if you don't want to see all those tiny little ticks, then mm-hmm. taking away the X label will just have Stata kind of be more economical in how it labels and spaces out uh, these tick, tick values over here. Uh, same thing with the risk table. 
uh, this this is really a lot easier to kind of understand. Uh, it might be you don't want to look at you know those 20, 30 pairs of numbers, and you just want to see uh, four over here. Uh, that that kind of simplifies the look. This is just to remind you that you know in Stata you have so much control over exactly what it is that you want to see uh, and do. That's why really playing around with the code as much as you can from tutorials like this one or going into the Stata documentation and following their examples and then finally just you know sandboxing it for yourself and seeing what happens if you you know mess around change things here or there is really very important. So anyway I hope this was useful to you and I do encourage you by the way to look at 272 analytics for some of our other survival analysis work in Stata. I hope this tutorial was helpful to you and I would like to invite you to visit 272analytics.com for access to all our free statistics tutorials in Stata, SPSS, R, eViews, and Minitab. Here at 272analytics.com we provide data consulting primarily to graduate students. Therefore we work very closely with you in order to perfect your chapter 3 and chapter 4. That means helping you design surveys, uh, getting your data input, assisting you with fashioning appropriate research questions and hypotheses, uh, getting your data, extracting them, transforming them, cleaning them, uh, putting them through analysis, uh, interpreting them, explaining them to you so that at the end of the day you know exactly what story your data tell, why they matter, what they mean in a manner that lets you write a, a perfect chapter 4 uh, following a perfect chapter 3 and lets you defend your dissertation or thesis with complete confidence. We provide ethical consulting. It's not a writing service, so you will be responsible for taking our blueprint, our assistance, our consulting, and transforming them into an appropriate academic project for yourself. I'd also like to remind you that we provide the same services to undergraduate students who are working with quantitatively oriented assignments. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.